So, um, it's a huge pleasure to be here. I don't think I've ever spoken before a more distinguished audience. You may not think that, but, but I see you as the future of science in many ways. Um, if nobody did science, there wouldn't be any scientists. So, you've got to start somewhere. And uh, maybe this is the point when some of you will decide to, uh, for a research career or something like that. And uh, with these lectures, maybe that will, that will, will happen. That would be fantastic. Anyway, I'm very grateful to be invited to give a lecture here um, in this very exciting school. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, a field which started over, over 20 years ago uh, with a very funny little idea that I had one time at a conference. I'll tell you about that in a moment. Um, but the title of my first lecture, as you can see, is Guiding Light in New Ways. And you've been looking at this rather strange pattern, probably wondering what on earth it is. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about this. So let's have a closer look. What, what you were seeing was a slice of an optical micrograph picture in, an, in a microscope. The experiment is really quite simple. There's a length of, of uh, a strand of glass, an optical fiber we call it, about the thickness of a human hair. So 100 microns or so in diameter. And in the middle of that strand of glass, there is a complex microstructure, a nanostructure, which has very strange effect on light, or it would seem very strange if we hadn't planned that it would do this, actually. But <laughs> so you take a little length of fiber, you focus in uh, from below in the microscope with just simply white light, light like this lamp over here. And then what comes out of the top is uh, a lot of white light, and it looks a bit yellow in the picture, but in fact that's, that's white light, which is in the region around the central flower. It looks like a flower, no, with six petals, which would be a beautiful blue color. What has happened is that this short length of glass with this intricate pattern or structure in, in it has kind of separated the blue light out from the other colors and is transmitting a, a pattern of blue. So, okay, that's uh, what this is. Let's have a closer look. You can zoom in on the microscope. It's one of the nice things about microscopes. They, they, don't, they don't always go as far as you'd like, uh, but at some point you can certainly zoom in to some extent. So we, let me look a bit closer. It doesn't look all that much different, but let me now switch that picture from an optical micrograph to an electron micrograph using a scanning electron microscope. So this is the actual structure that you were looking at in the optical microscope, because you couldn't see some of these details. They're far too small, in fact, to be seen in the microscope, some of these details. That's three microns, three millionths of a meter. Um, and these, uh, these black regions are actually air, or hollow channels in, in the optical fiber, and these little pinprick uh, hollow channels are there as a result of the fabrication process, which I'll talk about in a moment. <clears throat> but the rest of it, the gray stuff, is in fact glass. So if we now go back, as first of all, I'm going to de delineate to mark out the different regions. So these yellow circles represent the bits of the regions of glass, the big fat regions of glass, and the little white dashed lines represent the hollow channels. Now let's keep those and go back to the optical picture. And now we can see that this blue flower of light, of six petals, is in the blue, the blue pattern is actually trapped between the hollow channels and in the glass. And what is unusual about this is that why on earth is it that the light is able, wants or decides or somehow or other stays in the glass, this is glass, and doesn't leak out between the gaps and end up here, for example. You know, if this, if this was, some, was water or some kind of liquid passing through a pipe, surely it would leak out through the, through the gaps and end up here, but it does, chooses not to. And the reason for this has to do with a fundamental property of light, which is, is, is resonance. I'm going to talk a, bit of, a little bit about that uh, later on. Okay, just to put this, the, the, the size of this picture that you're seeing in, in kind of context, that's more or less the size of a red blood cell. <clears throat> so this is a very small structure we can make structures that are well down in the nanoscale in these optical fibers. We can make a wide range of different structures. Uh, this is a gallery of some of the fibers that we've made uh, at my institute in, in Germany. They range from uh, a solid glass core over here with a pattern of hollow channels. Uh, the, the, here the hollow channels are much bigger. This is, uh, we didn't make this for the Mercedes company, although you might perhaps think that's the case, but, uh, but it, it actually guides light in the middle of the Mercedes symbol. This is two very thin membranes of glass. I'll talk about that in my second lecture. And there are also hollow um, 
uh, versions, hollow core versions of the optical fiber. Lots of different things. Okay, so that's just a little introduction to give you a kind of taste of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so, first of all, the question is that you're probably all asking is, how on earth do you make something like that? Well, I was asking the same question over 20 years ago, and you, the way we actually do it is a kind of nanoscale glass blowing. Have you seen people glue blow glass to produce beautiful vessels? They're usually about the size of something you can pick up. But we're doing this on a nanoscale. And when we first started trying to do it, it was something that had never been done before. Um, now this guy here, of course, you see the wife, and this presumably is several decades old. The wife is behind. Um, I think they'd probably be more equal these days. Anyway, you, you, when, you want to explore, <laughs> when you want to explore something, um, if it's not been explored before, there isn't any map. There's no kind of, nothing you can look up. You can't go to a textbook or go to a library or say, oh, this is how they did it, I'll do it now, no problem, you know. Uh, sometimes there is no, no one's, no one's ever done it before. You haven't a clue whether it can be done even. It, maybe it's impossible. And those are the really exciting things to try and do. I mean, I, there was a comment, I think, from Professor Messel this morning, that physics is behind everything. In some sense, is that true? That's true, but technology is often behind physics, too. Physics drives an idea, but you need technology to make it happen. So, how did we do it? Well, to cut a very long story short, we actually make these fibers in several stages. We first of all take capillaries. These are tubes of glass that are about a millimeter in diameter. And we stack them very slowly, much more slowly than in this animation. And in a clean room, we stack them into a kind of what we call a preform. It's the shape we'd like in the very tiny structure, but it's much bigger. In fact, it's about a centimeter across. And because we're putting each of these tubes in one, one at a time, we can introduce various kinds of features. We can introduce a solid glass core, for example. We can leave out one of the tubes to make a hollow core, a region where there's more hollowness, if you like, an absence of glass. We can put in some lasing material if we want to make a laser. We can make more complex structures which have certain symmetry, which break the symmetry of the structure, for example, these are thicker walled tubes, and that will create what, what, what is known as birefringence. That's to say the polarization state of the light. If you change it, you'll see a different response in, in, in the fiber when you make it. So first of all, we make a stack, and then we take this stack, and it's made from silica glass. Silica is the most common material in the crust of the Earth. And if you see a, a volcano erupting, or you see lava flowing, most of the material in the lava flow is silica, silicon dioxide. It melts at a very high temperature, you probably realize. But if you work with pure silica, it melts at an even higher temperature, so even higher than the temperature you get in lava. So we need a very special furnace to do this. It runs at maybe 2,000 degrees Celsius. And this is then, you heat the glass up to its softening temperature, you draw it down uh, to what we call photonic crystal fiber for various reasons. Um, and this technology... I'm going to show you some videos of it actually happening in a moment, but um, you can get very large collapse ratios, as large as maybe 10,000 or even more in linear dimension. You can make all kinds. Of, we actually incorporate a solid silica sheath around it to protect it when we make it, and you can make very small continuous holes. We've, we've measured holes that are 25 nanometers in diameter, and to put that in context, these fibers can be drawn to lengths of a kilometer, let's say, 1,000 meters, we can make a hollow channel that's 25 nanometers. If you made a hollow channel 25 nanometers in diameter and one kilometer long, it would have the same aspect ratio. If the channel tunnel, which is the thing that goes between England and France, you probably know this, onto the sea, if that extended to Jupiter, you would have the same aspect ratio as one of these. Now, I, we actually, my group, when I was in Bath, we put on an exhibition in London at the Royal Society there. And uh, foolishly, I put, it, put this in as a, as a subtitle. And there were some Guinness Book of Records guys wandering around. They didn't tell me this, but we ended up in one of their books. <laughs> so apparently they were impressed. Um, OK. And actually, this technique has been used for hundreds of years, thousands of years even. You can find samples of what, are called, what is called mosaic glass, which dates right back to the Ptolemaic period in Egypt. And in fact, this is 
a collar, a beautiful multicolored collar that, that was originally around a statue of one of the pharaoh's wives, I guess. Um, and this is actually in the Corning Museum of Glass in New York State. And uh, the pattern here, this was made by exactly the same process of making a kind of stack, a large version of the thing you want, and then fusing it together and drawing it down in size. So how does it actually look in reality? Here are some videos. I'll put them all up together. The first stage is the stacking of the capillaries, which is done with great care um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a very high-class clean room. And then this stack is then taken and put into this high-temperature furnace and pushed in. And at the moment, you'll see it, it emerging from the bottom of the furnace. You can see it's dropping off. And you can see it's narrowed down in dimensions because of the way the glass flows. This is then drawn down to what we call a cane, which is about a millimeter in diameter and which contains the structure that we had, but 10 times smaller in dimension. And then in the final stage, this cane is drawn down to fiber, coated with plastic to strengthen it and rolled up on a drum. Surprisingly, it all works, although I didn't know it would work uh, over 20 years ago, but this is the way we now make it. We did try lots and lots of blind alleys, the things that didn't work out. I'm not going to show you those because some of them are just embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> so just, just to get, again, a sense of scale, I think it's quite important in these things, a sense of scale. You know, I often see physicists go around with their fingers like this. And it's about a micron, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and they have this in their head, you know? This is a, I used to do this a lot. This is about a micron, you know? Because you think, we think on these scales. It's as if we were living inside these structures at those sort of scales. That's how we understand how things work. So here we are. We start with a centimeter. We collapse that by a factor of 10 in the first stage of this drawing process down to about a millimeter. And in the final stage, we collapse it again until it's so small you can hardly see it. Um, but this contains the same structure as we had at the beginning. <coughs> yeah, and if you're unfortunate in the lab and you have some interlopers in the lab, you may find there's a fruit fly wandering around. <laughs> And if you catch him, you may find he stole some of this fiber. <laughs> and this particular guy, he chose a hollow core fiber. That's a hollow core in the center. So that's, that hollow core is maybe 20 microns in diameter. That's quite big. You know, for me, that 20 microns, that's big. You know, when you're talking 100 nanometers, that's small. <laughs> so this fruit fly is huge, you know, compared to the size of the hollow core. Okay, that's how we make it. Now, I was told, and I hope this is true, that you're all very smart. Um, so, and, and you wouldn't mind a little bit of mathematics. I'm sure some of you are much better in mathematics than me. But I, I, I'm going to just do, use a little bit. This is the only time I'm going to use some mathematics. But mathematics is, for me, it's, it's the tool of choice. It's, it's fantastic what you can do with it. And it's not that difficult, despite what people say. So, let's see. The basic physics of light. Let me just talk a little bit about the basic physics of light. Maybe you know all this already, but um, to be honest, it's taken me many decades to kind of understand this stuff in a properly and intuitive way. So what is a wave, first of all? Well, you all know the relationship between velocity and frequency and wavelength, V equals F lambda. We all learn that. Uh, there's a picture of a wave. There's the wavelength. This is something called a wave vector because it points in the direction of the wave. It's a sensible name, a wave vector, so that K. And if, if the wave is traveling in glass, it travels more slowly. So the velocity is smaller. If the velocity is smaller for the same frequency, you get a smaller wavelength. And you can demonstrate this by waving your finger up and down in the air and walking along. So if I walk slowly, the wavelength is short. If I walk fast at the same frequency, the wavelength gets longer. Simple. But very useful to have clearly in your head. So let's just animate this. So there's the wave moving along. And one thing you, you'll notice maybe about this, if you look at the intersection points of the dark lines, they're shooting across really fast, whereas they're going much more slowly here. This is a very important thing about wavefront velocity. It's, it's not really a, a velocity, in the, it's not a vector. It doesn't, you can't split it up into two orthogonal components. It doesn't behave like that. Let me show you why this is so. So I promised some mathematics here. It's not very complicated, actually. Maybe you've done some vectors and stuff, but I hope it's not too bad. But there won't be too much of this. But, so here's the amplitude of the wave. It's a cosinusoidal function. It oscillates, you know, so it's got some kind of 
uh, argument in, in the cosine. And this is, this is the wave vector. This is this guy over here. That's the direction of the wave. This is a position vector minus the frequency of the light times time. You can write that out in full, kx, the x component of the wave vector, the y component. The x and the y coordinates are here. And this omega is the frequency of the, is, of the light times 2 pi. Now, if you think of this omega, if t increases, you wait for one period of the oscillation, the phase goes up by 2 pi. So the wave comes back to where it was at the beginning. It repeats. That's why it's called the period of the wave and the frequency. Okay, we can do various things. We can, divide, we can, do, we can work out this, this wave vector, and it has a magnitude of 2 pi over the wavelength. We can also write it out like this if we want. But what I want to do is think about how we actually define these, these, wa these wave fronts. So the equation of a wave front is when this thing here equals a constant. When this thing is equal to a constant, then we're sitting on one of these wave fronts. We're moving along with it. It's, it's as if we're sitting, a, you're on the sea, you're, you're maybe on a, what do you do? What do you call it? Windsurfing? You're, you're being carried along by a wave. You're actually perched on the wave and moving with it. So actually, when you're doing that, you're solving this equation. You might not think you are, but you're solving this equation. Now, we can work out the velocity of the wave in this case. Um, oh, it's come up. Sorry, it doesn't come up on my screen. Hmm, something. It's never happened before. Ah, here we are. Yeah, it's better. Um, so we can work out the actual velocity by differentiating. So this is a little bit of calculus. dx by dt gives us a velocity, and it's a partial derivative, so we're just looking at the velocity in the x direction. If you work that out, this is the velocity. You just differentiate this thing, we get the velocity. It turns out this velocity in the x direction is omega, the frequency of the light, times 2 pi over the wave vector component in the x direction. Now, you can look at this, and you can say, well, look, I can make that k, I can make that point anywhere I want. The x component here can be very small. It can be zero even. Because if k is, if I turn the wave and make the wave go entirely in the y direction, then this goes to zero. And that tells me that the phase velocity in the x direction goes to infinity. Similarly, in the y direction, I can do a similar calculation. And, and you get these, you get that sort of, uh, uh, that the, 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 the intersection point of the wave along a, a straight boundary can actually travel at huge speed. If you've ever stood on the seashore and watched the waves come in and hit the, hit the sand, hit the beach, of course you do that a lot in Sydney, they come in and they come in at an angle. The actual angle, the point where the wave hits the beach, moves along extremely fast for exactly this reason. This is a very simple thing in a way and at the same time difficult to grasp perhaps, but very important when you think about how light behaves in different materials. Okay, sorry about that. No, I shouldn't be apologizing, because for me this is really important, this kind of thing. But let me talk about refraction. It's another very important aspect of light. Um, refraction, of course, causes all sorts of beautiful things, such as the raindrop imaging a flower, um, which I find somewhere on the web. But let me, let me think about a much simpler situation. Here is a beam of light coming in. These are the wave fronts of the light. They're coming in, they're actually in glass, so the refractive index is higher, the light is traveling more slowly in here. It hits a boundary, and we have air on top. And what I'm doing is plotting the instantaneous electric field of the light. So you can see the individual wave fronts. The light gets reflected off the boundary, it comes back, and interferes with the light coming in, creating this rather beautiful moving pattern. And on the other side, we have the refracted beam going off in some direction. And if you look at the simulation, you'll notice that the, 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 if the wavelength of the light, if you like, the phase velocity along the boundary of the light is the same for, on, both sides, on both sides of the boundary. In fact, this is the condition that determines the direction of that, that beam, because in the air, the wavelength of the light is, is larger than it is in the glass. And in order, in order for the for the effective wavelength along the boundary to be the same on both sides, this has to go off at some angle. You can easily write that construction. It's quite simple just to stick it, draw, take a piece of paper and, 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 and draw this. So this is the reason why you have refraction. Um, the normal thing, though, is not to show the actual instantaneous electric field, but to plot the field intensity. This is the kind of thing you're used to seeing. And in this case, we see 
We don't see any motion. The pattern is stationary. We do see interference fringes caused by the interference of this beam with this one. And these are in the glass. On the other side, we have the refracted beam shooting off at some angle. Now, we can use those ideas to, um, we can use those ideas to explore what happens as we change the incident angle of the light. And here, what I'm doing is tilting. You can see the wave fronts are tilting. And something quite interesting is happening here. Um, I just slow this down. No, I'm just going to play it to you. So, so as the if we send a wave in from glass and the angle is too shallow, it can't get through. And the reason it can't get through is that it's impossible for the for the light on this side, for the wavelength of the light along the interface of the light in the air, it's impossible for that wave to to match the wavelength of the light along the along the boundary. So it just can't exist. The light is unable to propagate, is unable to break through the barrier and end up in the air. If I, however, change, if I change the angle of this, let me just do it, so I tilt it up, you can see various, you can see the fringes are getting closer, and all of a sudden it is able to break through. And that's the critical angle, and beyond that angle, the light is able to refract to the other side. So there is a range of angles where the light can be completely reflected at that boundary. And the reason for that is that the wavelength of the light in along the boundary on both sides, you simply can't match the two. But if you go to a larger angle, it can indeed break through. So we could put this into a little bit of uh, mathematics here. Um, this, in fact, is the well-known condition, if you've ever studied this, for the critical angle of the light is the arc sine of 1 over the refractive index of the glass. And at that point, for, for angles... Uh, as it says, of their total internal reflection is what this is called. It, it occurs when the wavelength along the interface is less than the minimum wavelength in air. And the condition is that the angle is greater than the critical angle. Okay. So, total internal reflection is very important for guiding light. Resonance is also very important. You can, amongst other things, break wine glasses with resonance. don't know if any, any of you have ever done that. It's quite fun. Um, you can do other things. You can study what light does in uh, wavelength scale uh, structures. And this, of course, light has been studied for a long time. Thomas Young there on the left was the first to propose that light, in fact, was, was a wave. Um, and uh, Gustav Mee, who worked about 100 years ago, a little more, thought about uh, how light resonates in, in spheres of, of, of water, for example, as you would find in the causes, causes, causes rainbows. Uh, this is a beetle with the most beautiful colors. Uh, these colors are caused by the resonance of light in a wavelength scale structure that is grown into the beetle's shell, the beetle's carapace. This is the colors you see in a thin layer of oil um, on water. And, of course, this is a butterfly, the morpho butterfly from South America, which has beautiful blue in, in it. So let me talk a little bit about resonance. And here I'm going to show you some more animations the thing I'm going to show you the modeling for, this is a thin film resonance. The resonance is in a layer of air. So this is a, if you like, it's a little bit like a hollow channel going through an optical fiber. So we have an air layer, we have glass above and below, and if light comes in at a certain angle, it will refract into the air, the angle becomes shallower, it gets reflected and gets transmitted. And we can solve the equations for this and see what the, what the field actually does. And as we actually tilt the angle of the light coming in, I'm going to sl uh, slow this down in a moment. But uh, you can see we get you can see all sorts of complicated things happening there as the angle changes. So let me get my mouse to come back. Is it over? Here? Mouse keeps disappearing sometimes. So. Let's see if I can. There we are. Okay. So let me just stop this and start at the beginning. So here we have uh, the light coming in and getting. Effective. working. Better. Right. Okay, so let's now, what I'm doing now is changing the incident angle of the light, making it larger. You can see below the interface, you can see an interference pattern down here. And there's also some interference going on inside the air. And the spacing is larger in the air because the wavelength is bigger. In the glass, it's smaller because the wavelength is smaller in glass. And if we continue to increase the angle here, you notice something interesting happens. At a certain angle, 
the, there is no sign of any of that complicated beating. It, this looks exactly like the wave above. And this is what happens when you have a resonance in the layer. When the layer becomes resonant, you get a lot of light, a big enhancement in the field intensity in that layer of air. And meanwhile, the light would just travel straight through the structures if, as if the layer of air wasn't there at all. That's what happens when you have a resonance in, these, in this situation. It's quite remarkable that it happens, but actually it's a characteristic of any kind of resonance. It also works for light. If we increase the angle still more here, increase it a little bit, come on, you can do it. Okay, so let's go. That was that resonance. We find, a, we find a second one later on. Yeah, there we are. There's a second one with two, two sort of rows of, of resonances uh, above and below in the air layer. And we keep going, increasing it, and then something very interesting happens here. At this point, the light is beginning not to be able to get through the air layer. In fact, the, 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 this, is, this is the point at which the wavelength in the glass is uh, too... Um, to, to, it, it, we, cannot, no, we can no longer match the wavelength along the boundary in the air and in the glass. And the, the fields, they're not really supposed to exist there. They're not permitted to exist because the wavelength is wrong. And the, you've got frequency and wavelength that simply doesn't work. You cannot say V equals F lambda. That equation is no longer satisfied. This means that the wave can't exist. What does it do? It becomes what we call evanescent. But being light... This means that it can kind of tunnel through. It may be evanescent, but there's still some probability the light can actually tunnel through and break into the glass on the other side and create a wave. And there's a free running wave on the other side. The light has tunneled through the layer of air and come out on the other side. So tunneling effect, spooky. You see it in quantum mechanics, and, and uh, particularly spooky there, because electrons can do this. But this is light. And if we, can, if we increase the angle still more, then um, it gets more and more strongly reflected, and you can see the light is fading away in the region above here uh, and getting more and more strongly reflected down below. Okay, that's a layer of air. Let's now have a look at the reverse of this. See what happens. Here we have a layer of glass between uh, air layers. This time the refraction, the angle gets larger as the ray comes in, bounces around inside, and let's have a look at the movie in this case. Also, my mouse back. There we are. Stop this. And just ch now I'm changing the angle, and we can see that in this case, also with a layer of glass, we can find a resonance. There it is. When the wave just goes straight through, creates high field intensity inside the glass, and appears on the other side. And we move away from that, the light gets, starts to become strongly reflected. And if you go to too large a value, well, you can see the, wave, the wavelengths are tilting more and more, so they're almost vertical above here, you know. And, and, and when you hit the critical angle, these, wave, wave, these, this, these, this, these waves will be perfectly vertical, and then they're no longer able to penetrate. Um, the, 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 then the light is able to, to exist in the glass, but not in the region above and below, um, because we hit the critical angle at that point. So this is... This is some, some pictures of what light does. These are quite simple things in a sense. We do very complicated things with this, this physics, actually. But the basic physics is really quite, uh, quite simple at the, at the base of it. Now, you can do things with hollow channels in these fibers. To come back to the fibers, let's think we have, we have a hollow channel which consists of, of air running through the glass fiber. And we launch light in directly, directly into the hollow channel. Um, and it turns out that you, can, um, that, that you can get a resonance a little like the one I showed you a moment ago with the, the air layer with glass on either side. You get the same thing in a, in a circular channel running through a piece of glass. So you, get a, you can get a resonance in here. At certain wavelengths, that resonance will exist and tra travel along. At certain wavelengths, it will be strongly confined in this, this layer, but not perfectly confined. It, it will leak away as it travels. Um, and the lifetime, how long it spends in there, will depend on the leakage rate. So what, what happens is that certain colors spend longer in here than other colors because the wavelength is different. And you can get some beautiful pictures from this. This is a picture of one of our fibers that we made. These are hollow channels of different sizes, slightly different sizes. There's a hollow core in the middle that in this case is guiding white light. But 
The channels in the region around, all kinds of different colors, greens and blues and so on, those colors are created by uh, resonances at certain wavelengths that live for a longer time. So, so this one would have a blue color which lives for a longer time, this one a green, and so on. So we're kind of distilling, we're taking white light and we're distilling out the colors that we may want, or maybe not want, but that's what the structure is doing for you, automatically. And in fact, if I just, in the background of this picture, that's the reason why this happens. That the, the blue light is, has a very long lifetime in the region in the center, but all the other colors leak away. Okay, so what about optical fibers? Well, they're most the solid core optical fibers, the kind that, that, were, that, that are used in the, in the World Wide Web, for example, in telecommunications. They rely on total internal reflection. And the idea for doing this goes back to the middle of the uh, 19th century. First person to do it was a, a Swiss gentleman called uh, Jean-Daniel Colladen. His experiment involved a water tank with a hole and a window, and the water jet comes out of the tank, and then what he did was he shone some light in from the right, through the window, into the water, and then into the jet. And he demonstrated that light could be guided inside this jet of water. As is often the case in science, this was repeated by someone else called John Tyndall, and the someone else who repeated this experiment became much more famous than Colladen. What can you do, you know? <laughs> so anyway, they both contributed to, the, to, to this result. And you may think that's a pretty trivial thing, uh, whatever. Maybe so, but then a long time later, a hundred years later, more or less, the step index fiber appeared. And this is an optical fiber where the refractive index in the core is higher than in the cladding. This, these are the conditions you need for total internal reflection, that thing I showed to you a moment ago. So if you make this thing correctly, you can get light to be guided in a single optical resonance, if you like, or mode in the core, and it can travel for many kilometers in the core, and that is what is used for telecoms, telecommunications. If we look at the side of this type of fiber, here's the cross-section, there's the core. We send some light into this. It bounces to and fro. And at certain angles, you will find a mode appears in the core. The refractive index difference is quite small, as you can see here. Um, and if you're the guy who thought of doing this for telecommunications, you win a Nobel Prize. So back in the 1966, he suggested to, I think, the reception he got for this was a lot of laughter from many people. This was, I think, the head of the British Post Office had something to say about this along the lines that this was, you'd have to be crazy ever to think about doing this. You know, just do something useful. Uh, <laughs> I forget the quote, but, but anyway, there he is sort of playing around with the very first optical fibers, and uh, we all know that that was a huge success after a decade or so. Photonic crystal fibers, um, well, you can do the same kind of thing with these fibers as well. You can make hollow channels in the cladding and in this case, the, the refractive index in the glass core is greater than the refractive index that you get in the cladding, simply because you've mixed some air with the glass. And if you like, the, the, the average of, of the mixture of air and glass has a lower refractive index than the core. So once again, this uh, structure guides by total internal reflection. Uh, we can then use some of our ideas, because it, this isn't exactly the same as the, as the telecommunications fiber. These are hollow channels. There's something different about this. In order to understand this, we can then think about, let's think about a hollow channel passing through some glass, very similar to what I showed you a moment ago in terms of basic physics. Um, and if we imagine light coming in from some angle and hitting this hollow channel of air, um, it will be reflected. These are the wavelengths of the light. You get a strong reflection from this because, um, because the, <coughs> the light is, is, is unable to to travel in the air because the wavelength simply doesn't, doesn't match. So, so the light is evanescent in the hollow channel. It's a, it's a very strong barrier to the progression of the light. It gets strongly reflected. There may be some tunneling, some small amount of light that manages to tunnel through, as I showed you, but basically this is a strong barrier to the light. So the light is rejected from this hollow channel, this tube by total internal reflection. If we then have a look at a photonic crystal fiber, and this is the very first one we made, um, uh, let me zoom in. 
So these, these are narrow hollow channels of air, and this is the core. There's a missing hollow channel in the middle. If you think about putting light into that core, and think about my plumbing analogy, you know, making a pipe for piping water around the place, you'd have to be crazy to make a pipe out of uh, six wires, basically. These are the barriers that keep the light in. You put the light in the core, surely the light will just escape through the, through the in between the, the hollow channels. It can't, surely you can't trap it in there. You know? On the other hand, if I take the average refractive index out here, it's lower than in the core, and that would seem to say we have total internal reflection, you can trap the light. So we have two, we have two pictures in our head at the same time. One says it's a waveguide, and the other says, hey, it's not a waveguide. So what do you do? You do the experiment, if you can. And we find that it guided light very well, this structure. Well, we did find something very curious about it, which was that it, it only ever guided, only ever produced one pattern of light coming out of the fiber. So the far field pattern from the fiber always looked the same, more or less. It didn't matter what color of light you used. You got the same kind of pattern. And this meant that there was only one kind of resonance that could exist in the core, only one kind of mode that could exist in the core. And this was the fundamental mode, the one that just had one lobe of light, one nice clean lobe of light. These are the hollow channels that keep the light in. And because the fundamental mode has, has a certain size, its head, if you think that's the head of the mode, if you like, it, it, that, that's too big to squeeze between these gaps. So it can't escape. What do you do when you want to keep sheep in a field? You make some posts. You make sure the posts are closer together than the size of the sheep, typically. Otherwise, they can escape. So it's the same story here. You make the spacing between the posts smaller than the size of the sheep, in this case, the mode. Whereas if we look at one of the higher order resonances in the core, these have smaller heads, if you like, so the smaller sheep, and they can escape between the gaps. So the higher order modes, the ones that look like this, they all escape, they all leak away, whereas this one is retained. So it's a little bit like keeping light behind bars. This gentleman, who's not very happy, is being kept in a prison cell. And the reason he can't escape, using the language of light, is that he's not resonant with the bars. The bars of the cage are clearly anti-resonant with him. But not only that, he's not resonant with the windows either. He's too big. He can't, can't squeeze between, between the spaces between the bars. So basically, this is what we're doing to light. <laughs> okay? Uh, it's kind of what we're doing. Right. So, just a little interlude here, keep your eye on the time. But um, when you work on this kind of thing that's never been done before, science journalists get interested, and they sometimes write some very funny things. Um, this appeared in a local newspaper in Bath, in England, in the west of England. High-tech sea mouse beats prof to answer. I don't know what the question was, but anyway, he beat the prof to the answer. The sea mouse, by the way, is this creature here. It's about this sort of size. I've never seen one actually in reality, but it lives in mud. It's covered in brown mud, so typically it looks, doesn't look like anything at all. But if you take it out and give it a good wash and look at it in the sunlight, you see these beautiful colors in its hairs. Uh, all kinds of colors here, greens and yellows and even blues. If you then are intelligent, look at this, and you ask yourself, what could be going on here? What's causing this color, as Andrew Parker did? Uh, you then talk to some physicists. At a, at a suitable physics department, which happens to have been here at the University of Sydney, actually. Uh, you talk to Ross McFedrin, for example, who's a professor who knows all about the theory of what light does and different structures. And you put this in a microscope and have a look. You discover the cross-section of these hairs looks like one of my fibers. So they contacted me and said, uh, your fibers, you know, the, the sea mice has made these fibers before. Ho, ho, ho. He, knew, he knows how to do it and so on. So this timorous wee beastie, that's a kind of Scottish expression, expression for this, this, uh, this, this frightened little creature, kind of, has managed to produce things and get there long before you ever did. Ho, ho, ho. So, nice. Okay, what can we do with this? Um, just briefly, I'm going to show you one application, but tomorrow I want to concentrate on some of the weird and wonderful things you can do with these structures in terms of physics. But um, I would just want to show you one example of a revolution that these fibers have, have kind of created. And this is a new generation of 
white light sources. The kind of bulbs, you know, electrical bulbs that you're used to, they produce white light, sort of. You know, they're not very bright. They produce lots of heat. But this, these, uh, you can actually generate broadband supercontinuum light, it's called, because it's a very broad bandwidth and very bright. Uh, it's like a white light laser. Why am I playing you this, you're going to ask? Okay. That strange spooky sound is, is what's known as a whistler. And these whistler waves are created when there's a bolt of lightning, let's say, in the northern hemisphere. This creates a disturbance in the plasma sphere around the Earth. And this bolt of lightning creates a pulse. And you get whistler waves that travel along the Earth's um, <coughs> geomagnetic field lines. And this is a plasma out here. And plasmas typically have what we call anomalous dispersion, which is that higher frequencies travel more quickly than lower frequencies. So if you're down here in Australia, and you've got some kind of amplifier with a long cable, and you put some headphones on and simply listen, you can hear the consequence of this lightning strike. The high frequencies arrive first, the lower frequencies arrive later. So it sounds like a whistle. You can hear that. It's a recording of whistler waves. If you could avoid this dispersion, the fact that the different frequencies travel at different speeds, you would hear the lightning crack the way we hear, you know, it's like a very sudden sh shock is what you would hear, You'd like a hammer blow hitting a surface. Instead, we hear this frequency spread out by what we call dispersion. This is very important in optical fibers, it turns out. You put a pulse of light into an optical fiber, you do want to receive a whistler wave at the end because that's not very useful. It, there's not much information in it. Um, in fact, we can control this dispersion in the optical fibers by structuring them. So this is a term, this is, this is a term which represents the dispersion of the glass. And this is what it does as a function of wavelength. This is bulk silica glass. If we then make an optical fiber with a very small core, this is 0.8 micrometers in size, and we look at what happens to the light in that small core, we're able to change the dispersion of the silica glass into a completely different curve. So it's moved up, and we created what we call a zero dispersion wavelength. And at this point, what, we've, what we have is that all the frequencies of the light travel at the same speed within a certain range. So we've eliminated that Whistler wave effect. The high frequencies no longer arrive earlier than the low frequencies, and you get a very sharp pulse at that point over a certain bandwidth. Now, this turns out to be very important, um, particularly because in the fibers, just by changing the size of the core, we can tune that zero dispersion point to be anywhere in this range. And you'll have to take my word for it, but there are lots and lots of important lasers that generate wavelengths in this range. And if you want to generate a broadband white light source, there's a simple recipe. You design one of these fibers so that its zero chromatic dispersion wavelength is the same as that of the laser. And what this does for you is it keeps the energy packet, the pulse of light, it keeps it together. It, it doesn't turn into a whistler wave. It has very high intensity, and this enhances what we call nonlinear effects. Nonlinear effects happen in a material. If you imagine you have a nucleus and you have electrons, and you apply an electric field to this. This is with, with the field very small. Nothing much is happening here. And um, the material responds. This is to say we separate the electrons from the nuclei, but when we apply an electric field, we call this a polarization. And if we, uh, if we, if we do that, we find, first of all, we apply some field. If we change the direction of the electric field, we get exactly the same displacement between the electrons and the nucleus when we go down or up in this case. And this is what happens when you have linear waves, when nothing nonlinear, nothing strange happens. You can also have a term where when you push it downwards, it goes further than when you push it upwards. And this is this, this term here, which depends on the electric field squared. And there's finally a term here, which is the one that's really important for optical fibers, where we have a cubic distortion. So, so there's the, the, the pushing down and pushing up is the same, but, you, but the actual distance it goes is a function of the electric field itself. Now, if you've ever built an audio amplifier or you're into hi-fi, you know that the human here hates 
second harmonic, uh, love second harmonic distortion for some reason. That's why old valve, um, valve amplifier sounds so good, apparently, because they have lots of second harmonic distortion. But it hates the sound of third harmonic distortion. But if you're working with optical fibers, this is the magic one. This does all sorts of wonderful things for you. And one of them is it allows you to produce a super continuum of light um, from quite small laser sources. And this is the revolution I was talking about. If we take a fiber with a, a, a design like this, solid glass core, six micrometers, this has been designed to have a zero dispersion wavelength that matches that of a laser, we can generate a broadband supercontinuum very simply with a fairly short length of fiber. And these are really bright sources. This is the, a result from a company um, that you can buy now. Uh, this is a picosecond laser over here behind. The light is going, the pulses are going into a length of fiber and you're generating this incredibly bright supercontinuum light all the way, completely covering the visible spectral range and even going into the infrared. And it's actually dangerous. You don't want to look into that. It's, it's uh, a lot brighter than the sun. It's about 10,000 times brighter than the sun, actually, if you work it out. <laughs> Which is pretty amazing when you think about it. But that doesn't mean if you had 10,000 suns and you put them together, you wouldn't get this brightness. And the reason for that is that this is laser light and is coherent. You can get much higher uh, brightness uh, if things are coherent. If you have, you have 10,000 suns, it'll have the same brightness as one sun. Turns out. You can ask me a question about that if you want. <laughs> so there you are, a million times brighter than an incandescent lamp, that source. So if you, if, you, if you do 10, maybe 15 years ago, in a laboratory all over the world, you would use a simple incandescent lamp to produce a, a, a broadband spectrum like this, and you'd maybe spend a couple of days making a measurement because there were so few photons. With this source, it's a million times brighter. You can imagine the effect that has on the experiments. You can now do them in a fraction of a second. And in fact, these sources are in many microscopes that you find in biology labs uh, all over the place. It's, big, it's a big success story of these, of these fibers. So looking at the time, I think I have 10 minutes, yeah. if that's correct. Good. So my final topic has to do with the holocore photonic crystal fibers. So far, I've been talking about the solid core and some of the applications, um, but the holocore, in a way, is the one that really has broken the mold, has made it possible to do completely new things. Um, so it'd be quite nice to know how they work. Uh, but uh, before I do that, just let me uh, say that, that right at the beginning of this field, um, I did say something about um, over 20 years ago, thinking of this crazy idea, and well, would it work or not work? But um, I think I learned something from this, which is that if you have what you think is a crazy idea, it may not be so, so mad after all. You know? It's worth pursuing it or satisfying yourself that it might work or it might work, not work. Um, and the idea here was to combine an idea that had come from a different field, um, the idea of a band gap, which you find in semiconductors, um, an electronic band gap. That's a region of electron energy where there are no electron states, where electrons are not permitted to exist. And this is the reason why computers work, um, semiconductors work. It's very, very important. But you can do the same thing with light. And what I decided to do back in 1991 was to try and create these, this band gap for light, but do it in an optical fiber, not in a three-dimensional material, but in a strand of glass. So I wanted to do this. This is an idealized picture of a structure that I, I wanted to try and make. It had a periodic cladding. It looks like a crystal, but the core was hollow. There was nothing there. So the refractive index of the core is less than the refractive index of the cladding. This means that total internal reflection cannot work. Forget it. It's never going to work. So you need, need some new physics. The new physics was the physics of the photonic band gap. But how does this work? What's it got to do with the band gap? How does it, where does it come from? Well, actually, it comes again from about 100 years ago from the discovery of Bragg diffraction, the Bragg condition by the father and son duo, uh, the, the, um, the Braggs. There's a picture of them on a stamp from, from Sweden, I think. So let's think about this. If we make a material which consists of lots of uh, planes of, 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 of different materials, but you make the reflections from each of these very weak, okay? They're spaced by, by lambda here, 
and I put some light in at different angles for certain wavelength, I find that at, cert a certain, at, a, at some particular angle, the light gets strongly reflected. And that, that is the Bragg angle. When you, when you work this all out, you get some, some formula like this, which you can look up or even derive if you want to. This is what they discovered. And they discovered this for x-rays, of course, in crystals, not, not for light. But you can do the same thing with light, as I've shown here. If we now change this experiment, and instead of having a weak reflection from each of these planes, then what you find is that the Bragg angle is no longer a sharp condition. It becomes smeared out. You get full reflection over a wide range of angles. So it's no longer a sharp condition. We have a large range of angles where the light cannot get in. It gets strongly reflected. If I now take two more of those sets of planes and superimpose them, I can produce a two-dimensional material, in this case, two-dimensional material, in which the light cannot get in at all just cannot penetrate into that, that region of space in, in here. Now the idea behind this came, I think the person I think really made this field important was Ilan Ibranovic, because he did an experiment and showed that this would work in three dimensions actually, but for microwaves. And to do this is not so straightforward, you need to think very hard about the design and so on, but, but if you could get it to work, well it could be quite interesting. But you may be asking a question, I've, what I've shown you here, well, can't you just do this much more simply? Can't I just do it with uh, some kind of perfect mirror? This could be, could be simply a sphere coated with metal or something like that, perfectly reflecting layer. Then light can't get into that space either. It looks just the same. But the difference here is that this, uh, this sphere, actually inside here, there would be lots of photonic states. The light is permitted to exist in there. It, there's no reason why it can't exist in there. Whereas in the photonic band gap material within that region, it's completely forbidden. You cannot have any states. It, it's a true photonic band gap, like an electronic band gap. The, 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 you simply cannot create photons. You try to create a photon, you can't. It says, no, guys, I'm not allowed to exist here. It's a quite remarkable idea, I think, anyway. So if you could make a material like this, if you create a hollow space, you could create a trap for light. People are doing this in experiments. You can also make a hollow core optical fiber, of course, which, is, which was my idea. And if this worked, taking a side view of a fiber like this, what you would find, thinking about rays of light bouncing around, if you choose the wrong angle, there is no photonic band gap, and the light just leaks away. If you choose the correct angle, you have a photonic band gap, and the light is trapped. And if you choose the wrong angle, again, it leaks away. So there's only a certain range of angles where we get light trapped in the core. But if you can find those conditions, then you can make a hollow core fiber with low loss. And here's a picture of one of the very best fibers that have been made. It was made in a company, actually. Um, and this one has... Uh, let me just have a closer look at it again. You can see the sort of beautiful pattern of the glass. The core size was around 20 micrometers in this case. Um, and if we think about the light bouncing it to and fro inside the core and count up the number of bounces that the light would make along a one kilometer length of fiber, it makes three million bounces, three million of these reflections for a 20 micrometer core. So if you work this out, this means that 0.9999999992 of the light is reflected at each bounce. That's an amazingly good mirror. I tell you, it's very difficult to make a mirror as good as that. But not only is the mirror amazingly good, it works for all angles of incidence and for all polarization states. And every, time, every single bounce, it's a new mirror, a new piece of material. It's remarkable, that physics, I think. So just very quickly, finally, go to all this trouble to make a hollow core fiber. Why would you bother? What might it be useful for? This is one point I want to make here. It allows you to keep light tightly focused. If you try to, to keep light tightly focused using conventional approaches, you might take a lens, focus the light down, and you get a certain spot size and a certain depth of focus. The light is tightly focused just over that length, that depth of focus. This is all worked out by Lord Rayleigh, again, a little over 100 years ago. You could take a stronger lens, you get a more intense spot, but the depth of focus is shorter. So the benefit of having higher intensity here, if that's what you want, is cancelled by the shorter interaction length, the shorter depth of focus. 
Um, you could maybe do this, keep light tightly focused by coating the inside of a glass capillary with metal. This doesn't work because metals have, compared to dielectrics, have absorbed light very strongly. And as the radius of this hollow channel gets bigger, the bore of the tube gets smaller, sorry, the overlap of the metal effectively increases and you get very high loss. So this, this is a reason, this is this old business of the surface area to, to, uh, to area, so the, the circumference to area ratio being a function of the size of the, of the bore. You're probably familiar with that argument. <clears throat> anyway, the net result is that the losses are huge. You could try and make a very complex structure which consists of a kind of cylindrical Bragg reflectors, and this has been done by a company called Omniguide in the States. This works to some extent, but uh, the losses are still quite high. This one decibel per meter, that means that three meters of fiber, you would lose half the light. So you could only go about three meters and then all the light's gone. You could take a simple hollow capillary, focus the light into the capillary and just hope for the best. But as you all know now, this is not a waveguide. The refractive index in the core is, too, is lower than in the region around the core, so total internal reflection does not work. So this will be very lossy. That doesn't work either. So what hollow core fiber does for you for the first time, it provides a solution for this 100-year-old problem, if you like. I mean, for, if you go back 30 years, people will say you can't do this. Forget it. Do something else. But these hollow core fibers allow you to keep light tightly focused over an almost infinite distance. Could be kilometers in the best case. And you get remarkable enhancements. If, for example, you're interested in keeping high intensity over a long distance, which for some experiments you want to do, you compare one of these optical fibers, the intensity times length integrated, compare that with what you get if you simply focus a laser beam down to a small spot. You get enhancements of about 10 million. That is a huge factor, 10 million, especially in a field like this where you want to, to keep the light at very high intensity over long distances. It's a huge enhancement. And this makes it ideal for what we call nonlinear optics. I was talking a little bit about nonlinear response a moment ago, the, the, the electrons and the nuclei and so on, all that, all that stuff. So to get very, if you want to work on nonlinear optics in gases, and this will be one of the topics I talk about tomorrow, um, you'd like to keep light trapped in a single mode in, in, the, in, a, in, 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 in the gas, so you can fill the fiber with gas. You, you can pump gases into the core fairly easily. All kinds of things are improved. You've got, you've got long path lengths. You can actually, it turns out, control the dispersion of the system. You get high intensity for a given power because of the small core size. And there's also a very small risk of damaging the material. Working at high intensities with lasers, it's very easy to damage things. If any, any of you ever have a chance to play with lasers, you'll discover that very quickly. Uh, <laughs> But uh, anyway, I'm going to talk about this tomorrow. But this is the one of the main motivations for developing holocore fiber, although there are some others as well. Um, so just to round up, that's a very recent picture of my group plus a few visitors, distinguished visitors we had at a workshop just last week in, in, in Germany. Um, and uh, so thanks to them, but also thanks to you for being such patient and responsive uh, audience. Thank you.